Alexander Campbell, the Irish Presbyterian evangelist who is credited with being the brains of the restoration movement of the 19th century. Campbell was a big writer, had his own newspaper that he published and tried to convince people to follow his movement. Uh, Campbell is credited with basically being the founder, the beginner of three distinct uh, religious traditions in the United States, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, the Independent Christian Church, and the Churches of Christ, the non-instrumental churches of Christ. He proclaimed an idealistic version of Christian unity. He's famous for having said, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity or love. Campbell believed that if only everyone would just let go of their oftentimes nationally based or regionally based religious doctrines, creeds, uh, theologies, their denominational affiliations, if you just wipe all that out and just go back to the New Testament, that Christianity could be entirely reunited. Specifically, he thought that Christianity could be united once everyone became rational and agreed with his particular vision of what Christianity should be. Predictably, he not only failed to unite the disparate sectarian divisions within Christianity, his movement actually added three new, deeply divided, competitive, and angry sects to the American religious landscape. Still, I have to defend him a little bit and say that this guiding principle is not a bad one. In essential things, let's reason this out. Let's work this out and come to agreement in the matters that are essential. But in matters of personal preference or opinion, let's be generous. Let people be different from us. Let them, let them be diverse. Let them hold to whatever views are specifically theirs. But on either side of the divide, let's remember that loving each other is more important than anything else. That in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, but in all things, there's this decision that we're going to be loving. It's a good principle, it's just that church folk had difficulty in agreeing on what that essential list was going to be and what is just a matter of opinion. Before the movement even had time to congeal into an easily recognized institution, the nation was being divided by a cataclysmic civil war, during which the Christian church met every year. They had an annual convention. They met in Cincinnati that was just, just barely north of the Mason-Dixon line and outside of, of the fighting. And at each of the war year's conferences, they passed resolutions in which they pleaded with God to damn the South. The year they met after the end of the war, they passed another resolution thanking God for having damned the South. Religious history has some very embarrassing moments to it. In much more recent history here in Springfield, in the early 1990s, our Chamber of Commerce decided that they would launch this fairly audacious project of enumerating community values. The values that they then, from the Chamber of Commerce, told the churches and the schools that they would like for us to begin teaching these values. I was stunned. Um, that a, a club of local business persons could be so filled with self-importance that they would think that they could dictate to churches what we should preach and what we should believe. <clears throat> but after more than 20 years of interactions with the Chamber of Commerce and their president, I realized that malignant narcissism was more likely the rule of operation than anything that anyone should be surprised about. But but even more disheartening than the fact that a group of business owners thought they should tell the church what their values ought to be was the church's response to the list of values that they rejected. They, they actually lowered the moral bar, which is always upsetting when churches do that. But the churches collectively reacted very negatively to, to this one value that was tolerance. They didn't want that word in the list. Several local church leaders were afraid that tolerance was a code word 
for no longer discriminating against gays and lesbians. And the chamber officials responded adamantly saying they had no intentions of even implying that the church shouldn't continue to discriminate against homosexuals. <laughs> that their interest was actually encouraging the church to accept religious pluralism, the presence of different religions, and of racial harmony, which didn't sell any better to them than no longer being able to discriminate against homosexuals. In the midst of that controversy, I received a copy of a letter from the pastor of one of our large local Baptist churches that informed me and everyone else that he was writing that if the city council succeeded in passing this list of virtues, that all of the churches in town would be forced to hire pedophiles to work in our church nursery. It was just so stupid. I mean, it was just, it, it was just, it was the most alarmist, uh, ridiculous kind of claim. And I, I started several letters in response. And uh, do you all know what a Truman file is? Harry, Harry Truman wrote several letters to his critics that he never mailed to them. He would just, he would get the existential pleasure of writing the letter and then put them in a file. And someone find, found that file after he was dead and they published them. So uh, I just actually yesterday, I have kept a Truman file for years and I just threw it away yesterday. I've reached an age where there's always the possibility that I could die and someone would find that file. Uh, <laughs> And, and it really hurt me to throw it away because I think some of my best writing, some of my most clever retorts were, were in those letters that were never mailed. But I, I think for my own spiritual health and for my memory, it was best to just go ahead and throw it away. I did eventually reply to this guy. I just didn't write him a letter. I simply corrected his spelling and grammar in his letter and put an F on it and sent it back to him. Uh, and oddly enough, I've never heard from him again, so I don't know. Maybe, that, maybe he didn't receive that as being as helpful as my students do, but Paul wrote to the church in Rome that they should all get along together and not try to force each other to agree with their personal opinions. Now, evidently, Paul was not conscious of the possible hypocrisy that could have been involved in Paul writing that to anybody. I don't read Greek any better than Tarzan speaks English, but if the English translation of his letter is true to the original, Paul wasn't even able to thinly disguise his own prejudice in a, in, in a passage where he was telling other people to not be so opinionated. You look at verse 1 in this pericope of Romans 14, welcome those who are weak in the faith. Now, if you can imagine a church that's big enough to have four or five adult Sunday school classes, and their names are on the doors, and one of them is weak in the faith. <laughs> and another one is strong in the faith. You can imagine that the people that go to the weak in the faith class didn't come up with their own name. That was, that was Paul's nomenclature for the people who disagreed with him. Now, in my home church, the college class uh, that I was in named itself lost and found, which was accurate enough for us, although even within the class there would have been considerable disagreement about who was lost and who wasn't. But for Paul, the division was very easy. If you agreed with him, you were strong in the faith. If you disagreed with him, you were weak in the faith. Even still, he was saying that you should even try to be nice even when it's obvious that these other people are wrong. You should try to be nice about it, even when they're clearly weak, even though he's just given us a perfect example of not really being very nice about it. Isaac Asimov is a scientist, a science fiction writer, and an enthusiast for science education, received a lot of criticism from the religious world in the 60s and 70s, but he wasn't very reticent about pushing back. If he had a Truman file, he didn't let it get very old before he pushed back. But in one of his responses to critics, he said, anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. With that, Asimov gets to the big challenge of tolerance. If people have a right to their own opinion, 
then they also have a right to be wrong. That doesn't mean that an informed opinion has the same value as an uninformed opinion. It doesn't. There's no comparison. And yet, realistically, we can't be tolerant of views, beliefs, ethics that somehow protect the things that hurt other people. The NFL has recently had to come to terms with the basic right and wrong of domestic abuse. And unfortunately, it's evidently been a historical problem. I don't pretend to know that much about professional sports, but they've evidently had a history of domestic abuse within professional football players. But Ray Rice uh, did what he did in an elevator that was on video, and that made all the difference when he hit his fiance in the face and knocked her unconscious. The Ravens' first response was to suspend him for two games. The attitude evidently was. Now, they're changing. and they, I, I have to congratulate, actually, the NFL has gone to great lengths to interview people that are experts in domestic violence. They're, they're trying to do something about it now. But, but they thought that domestic violence didn't have much to do with actually playing football. So they were fairly indifferent about it. On the other hand, a football player that was found to have smoked marijuana was typically subjected to a year's suspension. Because football makes a lot of its income off of advertisements from liquor and beer. So if their players begin to use a substance that is a competing product to their commercially advertised products, then that affects their bottom line. Beating up your spouse doesn't affect the bottom line. There are times, though, when tolerance comes at too high of a price. Still, we need some unity on essentials while we preserve liberty in non-essentials. But we can't deny that there are things that are essential, but coming up with agreement on that list is nearly impossible. One of the few public meetings in which I feel like I... I lost it, started shouting, was at MSU about a decade ago. And it wasn't a matter of a debate between an informed view and an uninformed view. I lost it yelling at the president of the university, who is, was a very smart man. But he held ferociously to a traditional Roman Catholic faith. So the president was adamantly refusing to include sexual orientation in the list of protected persons in the university's hiring non-discrimination policy. It was just one of those times when I could say that there was just, there was no more room for debate. This song that Barry and Sean are gonna perform for us uh, when I stop talking, mercifully stop talking. Um, the reason I asked them to do this one is the refrain is, this is not my opinion, I'm right and you're wrong. I mean, it's just this, this uh, adamant in your face kind of statement, but they're talking about the issue of homosexuality. There's really no more need to research this topic. There's, we're not looking for more information. We're just waiting for you to stop being stupid. That, you know, that's kind of what this song is saying. This is not a matter of opinion. There's no more research to be done. There's no more dialogue. There's no debate. I'm right and you're wrong. I assured him that I was on the right side of history and he was on the wrong side of history and that he would be remembered for having defended an irrational prejudice. Eventually, he chose to retire rather than change the university's policy, and the next president very quickly and very quietly changed the university's policy. Now, you might say in that case that the university president was weak in his faith, but it wasn't just a personal matter. It wasn't just that he could be wrong because it had an implication for dozens, if not hundreds, of gay university employees because it kept them from having the same pension and insurance benefits as the straight members of the university staff. Can you meaningfully maintain unity with those whose beliefs come at the expense of the health and welfare of others? When this controversy about tolerance first arose in our city, I delivered, classic for me, a very impassioned sermon arguing that tolerance is a religious value, and anyone that doesn't agree with me is just kind of dumb. 
a retired religion professor who was typically very kind and very complimentary of my work waited around until the line at the door had gone away and we were mostly alone. And he approached me and he said, you know, Roger, I don't usually disagree with you, but this time you're wrong. Tolerance is not a Christian value because that falls too far short. Love is a Christian value. The uncomfortable truth is that you can be so right that you are wrong. You can be right about a topic so forcefully, so uncaringly, that you become wrong. You can be right in a way that gives you a casualty count, and you can walk away thumping your chest, but you have not transformed any hearts or minds. There are times that it is incumbent upon a prophetic community to announce that there are beliefs, there are values, there are laws, there are economic practices, there are military actions, there are federal budgets that are wrong. We just need to find a way to do it that doesn't necessarily lead to alienation, which means that we have to find a way to care more about being loving than we care about being right. You have been watching a progressive Christian video from the Community Christian Church of Springfield, Missouri. We encourage our viewers to donate to our efforts in feeding the homeless and hungry of our community. Write to us at Reverend Dr. Ray at AOL.com for more information.